it's particularly difficult these days to understand the etiology, the origin of what we believe. Like we're talking about the heart as a pump. Very few people even know where that comes from. We have conceptions which we hold to be true. And then we look for information that supports our point of view, which is exactly the opposite of how it should be. We should go into whatever situation we're talking about in an unbiased way. We need to be a questioning society, to be highly skeptical of experts in any field. Often there's agendas, there's issues, there's reasons why they say things. So you have to discard some of the old baggage to actually examine what led people to understand this in this way. We don't have a clue. So people need to understand that when it comes to life, we don't have a clue. So from there, you can actually start to learn. I mean, I graduated from college. I went to Duke, graduated in three years, mostly because I didn't like it very much. And I was just sort of desperate to figure out something to do with myself. All I knew at that point was I didn't want to go to medical school. And so I went to Africa. And it turned out when I was in the Peace Corps, I was given books by Rudolf Steiner and Weston Price on food. And it was sort of like a light went off saying that this kind of medicine that I for years had been rejecting and rebelling against was not the only kind of medicine. In fact, was not even what I would call the real medicine. It's certainly the common medicine, but I don't think it's real healing and it's not understanding why people get sick. I've been interested in the heart ever since, well, I had heart issues myself a little bit. And then as I started learning anthroposophical medicine, I heard that Rudolf Steiner said the three most important things for the evolution of humanity were, number one, that people don't work for money. The second was an interesting comment, which was that there are no such thing as sensory and motor neurons or nerves. All nerves are sensory nerves. The movement is done by something else, and the nerves sense the movement. And the third one, and mind you, we're talking about like actual humanity moving forward, was that the heart is not a pump. Probably most of you know that I wrote a book on the heart called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. And there were basically two points to the book. The first point was the heart doesn't pump the blood. There's really two people in the United States who are talking about this publicly. There's a friend of mine named Bronco First, and he's an anesthesiologist. And he wrote a book called The Heart and Circulation, an Integrative Approach. And it's a much more technical, in-depth book with hundreds of references. And it was written not for lay people, but for medical doctors, anesthesiologists, cardiologists, and scientists. But it's a really wonderful book. And so anybody who's really interested in the subject, I would refer them to that. The other interesting thing about the book was the foreword was written by two people. One was the head of cardiac anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School, and I believe the other was the head of pediatric cardiac anesthesiology. So you would think that doctors who are cardiac anesthesiologists would know something about the heart. And interestingly, they both said that essentially Bronco was correct and the heart can't possibly be a pump. And that that misconception is the reason we can't treat congestive heart failure better now than 50 years ago. And that of course is shocking for some people. So everybody learns, I don't know, eighth grade or whatever, that the way the blood flow works is we have a heart 
and then the blood comes out of the heart from the left ventricle. It goes through the aortic arch. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then it goes through the big arteries and then smaller arteries called arterioles. And then it goes to the capillaries, which are the tiny little blood vessels. And that carries the oxygenated blood, we're told, and the food. The capillaries are what bathe the organs and the tissues. And then from the organs and tissues, it goes to the small veins called venules, into larger veins, and then into one vein, well, to the superior and inferior vena cava that come back to the heart. And this was first described as a circuit, I believe, by a guy named William Harvey, who is to this day considered the father of cardiology. So before that, we thought that the blood was made anew somewhere. Sometimes we thought it was made in the spleen or the liver or, or the bone marrow. But it turns out the blood may be made in the bone marrow, but there is a continuous circuit, heart, arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart. So the question is, what causes the blood to move in this closed circuit? And again, this is something that everybody knows, or I would actually say they think they know, which is that the heart, quote, pumps the blood around the body. Now, it's very important to get into very clear definitions about what we're talking about, because pumping is a somewhat vague term. So we're talking about the reason for the movement of the blood. And the theory is that the heart is a pressure propulsion device. That's what I mean by a pump, which means the heart is a muscular organ. It weighs about 1.1 pounds. It has variable thickness. So it's approximately seven layers thick at some point. And at the apex, which is the bottom of the heart, it's actually one layer thick. You can actually stick your finger right through it. And the theory is the walls of the heart contract inward. They reduce the volume from this, that's diastole or relaxed, to this. That squeezing action pushes the blood around the body and back to the heart. Now, the first problem with this is if you realize that if you put the blood vessels end to end, which is not how it is, but if you took all the blood vessels out of your body, the arteries, the arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, etc., and laid them out in like a railroad track, it would be thousands of miles long. If you put them side by side, it would cover approximately three football fields. So that is a huge area to push fluid, which actually interesting, the fluid is very sticky, viscous fluid that has stuff in it. And what I mean by stuff is it has red blood cells, it has white blood cells, it has platelets. And some of them, like the red blood cells, are approximately the diameter of the internal diameter of the small blood vessels. Now, if you think about the amount of pressure you would have to generate to push sticky fluid 10,000 miles or in parallel, you know, all to perfuse a football field. There's an article I read probably 25 years ago called The Heart Is Not A Pump by a mechanical engineer. And he estimates that you would need approximately a thousand times the pump pressure to keep this viscous, sticky, stuff-laden fluid moving around this circuit. As he described it, it's an inelegant theory. So that's the first thing that strikes you. But it actually gets worse. The second thing was, there's a law, I think it's called Bernoulli's Principle that the velocity is always related to the surface area of the vessel that the water is flowing in. So I know it's not water, it's blood, but it's similar. As the diameter of the tube gets smaller, 
the velocity of the movement of the fluid gets, gets more. You can see that in any river. As the river narrows down, the movement of the river gets faster. If you, if you expand it out into a wetland, the movement of the water in the wetland is basically slowed down or even stopped. And that's exactly what happens in the body. The movement as it comes into the heart is condensed into these, you know, superior and inferior vena cava, and as it exits into the aortic arch, so it's a very small diameter, but at the level of the capillaries, it's basically a floodplain. And so it has to stop, and then it has to coalesce, and the movement has to start at the floodplain. So if you do a flow diagram of the movement of the blood, you find that the speed of the blood, the velocity, is fastest as the blood enters the heart through the right atrium. And it's the same speed as it exits the heart through the left ventricle. And then, of course, it gets slower and slower as it goes through the arteries until it gets to the capillaries where it basically stops and does like a little shimmy like this, which you could predict that because that's where the blood has to offload food and oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide and other waste products. So the, the blood can't be whizzing by the capillaries. This is the part of the system where exchange happens. So it gets very slow and then it starts going faster and faster and faster as it goes back to the heart. The blood is going fast as it enters the heart, fast as it exits the heart, which of course brings up the question, if the heart didn't make the blood go faster, what did it do to the blood? That's a question which we can get into, but it certainly didn't push it so it made it go faster or pump it. It's going the same speed. And the second thing is, if you go and you have a flow and it goes to zero and then it gets going, it has to start again. Any farmer, any person who works with hydraulics would say you have to put the pump where it stopped. You wouldn't put the pump where it's already going the fastest. So the pump must be at the tissues, at the organs but yet there's no pump there. So how does this work? Now, of course, nobody sees a pump at the capillaries. So they say, well, that can't be right because we don't see a pump. There is a pump at the capillaries and you can describe exactly what the pump is. Now, unfortunately, it gets even worse because let's just look at the heart and say, okay, the heart is generating this enormous pressure to move this blood all the way around the heart. And so the exit flow of the heart is called the aortic arch, which curiously goes north up to the head, and then it makes an arch, which is why it's called the aortic arch, and then it goes down to the rest of the body, and then it has a branch that continues on up to the head. And because I like to speak in analogies, it's like having a spigot off the side of your house and having a flexible arch-shaped garden hose attached to the spigot. So you put this arch on the spigot, you turn the water off, that's called diastole in the heart, and then if you turn the water on full blast, because we have a huge pump, what would happen to the aortic arch with this huge amount of water pressure going through the arch? Well, it's obvious that the arch would straighten out right? Now, curiously, when you look at the aortic arch in a cardiac angiogram, you find that in the part where the heart is generating pressure, known as systole, not only doesn't the aortic arch straighten out, as you would expect, but it actually curves in. I used to work in a cardiac cath lab during medical school, and I remember seeing that when there was systole, the heart, quote, contracts or pumps, and the arch bends in like this. And all I can say is that cannot be a pressure propulsion device. That has to be some sort of a suction. So in other words, there has to be a negative pressure, which is 
pulling the arch in and then somehow it relaxes when the pressure is released. That whole theory that the heart is generating pressure just doesn't withstand the look at the actual fluid mechanics that actually happen in the circulation. A fourth anomaly, which I didn't write in the book, but if you think about the other part of the circulation, which is the pulmonary circulation through the lung, we're told that the right ventricle, um, so it's the left ventricle that exits through the aortic arch, it's the right ventricle, which is called a low pressure pump that pumps the blood horizontally through the lungs. So the blood comes into the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle, and the right ventricle, quote, pumps it in a low pressure pump to the lungs. So if you think about that, so the right ventricle is an extremely thin-walled muscle, which can hardly generate any pressure at all. And then it goes into the lungs, which is this vast network of tiny little bubbles called alveoli, hundreds of thousands of them, all encircled by a capillary so that there's an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the blood into the air bubbles of the alveoli. Now, this is an extensive network of capillaries through which the blood is moving extremely slowly, stops and then comes all the way back through this extensive network of alveoli how is it possible that the movement force comes from this tiny little push from the right ventricle through this extensive network of capillaries in the lungs? There's no pressure generated hardly at all. An honest person could only conclude that somehow the blood is moving by some other device. Now, in order to explain what the pump is, and again, we're talking about what gets this blood moving at the level of the capillaries. Because of Bernoulli's principle and just fluid dynamics, as you go from this uh, watershed or wetlands, and then you narrow the tubes down as you come back to the heart, the blood, by just narrowing the tubes, will go faster and faster and faster. So once you get it moving, the, the other part of dynamics of fluid flow will get it moving faster as it approaches the heart. So the whole trick is what gets the blood moving. Now, in order to explain this, you have to have a slight detour into the true nature of water. So we're told that all matter exists in three phases or three states solid, liquid, and gas. So if you have copper, you have solid copper, you have molten or liquid copper, and then if it's hot enough, you have gaseous copper. There are no intermediate states. There's not like half gas, half liquid. It's one state or the other. And all of the different elements on Earth basically follow that law, with one exception, and that's water. Now, how do I know this? Because, first of all, I was an emergency room doctor for 10 years or so. And in medical school and in my medical training, we were told that the human being is 70% water, 99.9% .9 of the molecules in the human being are water, and it's all in this liquid phase because water has three phases, ice, water, and steam, and that's it. So you can prove that inside the cell, there's 70% of it is water. And I saw tens, maybe 100 people with bayonet wounds and gunshots, etc. And yet I never saw one person have squirting water out of their leg or belly. I never saw a person injured with a puddle of water on the floor next to them. They had blood but not water, even though the intracellular fluid, I was told, was basically pure water. Then I looked at something like jello. Now, we're told that jello is something like 97% water, and it has proteins, the gelatin proteins, which are necessary to somehow get the water to form into jello. And I asked myself, 
which state of water is jello? It's certainly not ice, and it's certainly not water, because you can poke a hole in jello and nothing comes out, and it's certainly not steam. So there must be a fourth phase of water, which has no particular name, but Gerald Pollack, who wrote a book called The Fourth Phase of Water, calls it easy water or exclusion zone water, or some people call it a gel phase. Anyways, it's a intermediate between water, liquid water, or bulk water, and ice. It has a completely different molecular configuration. Some people also call it structured water. Now, the reason this is relevant, and just like the example of Jell-O, is the way to create structured water, which is the term that I like to use, is to take proteins and water and add some energy in the system. In Jell-O, you add heat. And that unfolds the proteins. They interact with the water to structure it, to make it into a gel. And so then when you cool it, it forms a gel. But the reality is anytime you put water next to hydrophilic substances, it will form a gel layer next to the hydrophilic protein or substance, anytime. So one example that I've talked about is the so-called barometric limit, which in, in simple terms means that when you have a column of water, it could be in any size tube, that the weight of the water in a tube creates a certain downward pressure, right? So the higher the column of water in the tube, the more water there is in the tube, the more weight there is in the water, and the harder it is for the water to keep going up. And so there have been precise calculations on this so-called barometric limit, which I believe is around 33 to 40 feet high. In other words, a simple column of water can't go more than 33 to 40 feet high before the weight of the water becomes too great for the upward movement of the water to overcome. And so that is considered to be a well-recognized scientific principle. Now, that would predict, of course, that since what happens inside a tree is there is this column of water, in this case, it's called sap, and because it can't go higher than 40 feet, therefore, we would predict that there are no trees higher than 40 feet tall. because this sap, which is basically some sort of solution of water and salts and sugars and probably some minerals and some other things, once it's a column of over 40 feet high, the weight of the water is too much, and so it can't go any higher than that. The problem, of course, is we all know, and I can look out my window right here, and we've all seen trees that are 100, 200, 300, probably even 400 feet tall. So even though we have this well-recognized scientific principle, it simply isn't true. And the question then is how does the water go 200 to 300 feet high? And I wrote about this in my heart book because it's actually the same strategy the tree uses as one of the ways the blood moves back to the heart. And that is any tube that's made of a hydrophilic substance. Hydrophilic means it attaches to water, it interacts with water. Could be the plastic called napheon, it could be xylem tubes, it could be the proteins that line the capillaries in your blood. The nature of water, particularly the fourth phase of water, the structured water, the coherent water, what happens in the interaction of a tube like this with water inside is that there's a very thin gel layer that lines the inside of the tube. And that happens always just because of the nature of the interaction of water water 
and hydrophilic surfaces. Now, the interesting thing about that gel layer is it's always negatively charged. And that means there's a separation of the negative charges in the gel and the positive charges go into the middle of the water where there's liquid water or blood or sap. And because then these positive charges, otherwise known as protons, repel each other, then they start moving and they take the water along with it. And in the case of a tree, it can't move down, so it has to move up. And as long as there's a continuous column of water, it can basically move up probably indefinitely or to, I don't know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of feet. The same thing happens in our tissues. The capillaries are hydrophilic tubes. They create a gel layer. And then there's liquid water, in this case known as blood. Then there's a separation of charges, which creates obviously a voltage, a current. And this charges the protons in the bulk water, in this case, blood, repel each other. They can't go up through the arteries because the blood is coming down there. So they have to go the other way, which is through the venous circulation back up to the heart. So this method of the movement of liquid water is conserved over many you know, biological systems and even in non-biological systems. And in fact, you can even do an experiment, which Gerald Pollack has done, where you take a beaker of water and you suspend a horizontal tube made of a hydrophilic surface like naphia. And inside the tube, there will be a flow of the water going through the tube and around and through the tube. You can measure the velocity, you can measure the pH, you can measure the charge. Now, that means that just the nature of water interacting with hydrophilic surfaces has generated work or a flow. It gets even more interesting because you can then put that beaker of water in a lead box, so essentially shield it from all outside influences, and the water will slow down if not stop. And then you can take it out of the lead box and put it in the sun, and the water will start moving again and go faster and faster. That means the light from the sun, some part is actually the stimulus for the formation of the structured gel coherent fourth phase water lining the tube and is basically the energy through which this work of separating the electrons from the protons is accomplished. So just nothing but the sun creates voltage, creates work, creates flow if there's water in a hydrophilic tube. You can also put this beaker of water on the earth and that will increase the flow. You can put your hands on it and that will increase the flow. And you know that the speed of the flow, the velocity of the movement of the water is related to how much structuring is happening to the water. The more structure, the more separation of charges, the more protons, the more flow. So now we have an explanation of why being out in the sun is good for you, grounding to the earth is good for you, and things like laying out of hands and maybe Reiki and a bunch of other massage and actual physical touching of one person, especially through their hands, has a beneficial effect. You can also put animals like your dog next to it, at least as I say, most dogs, and that will increase the flow. Then you can put your cell phone or some other wireless device next to the beaker and that will decrease the flow, proving that the wireless device decreased the coherence of the water, decreased the flow, decreased the gel phase water in your tissues and in your blood vessels, and that decreases your circulation so that you become less nourished and less able to get rid of waste products. So the point of that was 
this so-called scientific principle called the barometric limit is actually not science at all. It's a, what I would call a superstition. The second part of the book is equally shocking to some people, but that is that I disputed the idea that the only reason that people have heart attacks is because of blocked arteries. And it's again, one of those things that's considered like just true. Everybody seems to agree from the man walking down the street to the head of cardiology at Johns Hopkins. The story goes, we have a heart, it's a muscle, it's got four different chambers. It has a blood supply, which is three major coronary arteries. All of the blood goes through those three major vessels. They go to different parts of the heart. And then we're told that something comes along to block the flow of the blood in these coronary arteries. Usually it's plaque, which is caused, we used to think, by cholesterol, and now we think it's inflammation. And the plaque builds up in one or more of these arteries and the blood can't get through. And so the part of the heart downstream from the blockage doesn't get enough blood flow, therefore it doesn't get enough oxygen, therefore it doesn't get enough food, and it can't get rid of waste products, and so that causes a heart attack. So the obvious thing to do is to either scrape out or somehow get rid of the plaque or bypass that artery with another vessel so that restores the blood flow and then everything is fine. So that's the so-called thrombogenic theory of heart disease because the blockages are called a thrombus. And so the theory says the reason for heart attacks is you get a thrombus or clot in one or more of the arteries leading to different parts of the heart. The blood can't get through and then you can't get enough food and oxygen and then it dies. When the food and oxygen deficit is small, you just have chest pain, otherwise known as angina, especially if you exert yourself. So you put more of a load on the muscle and then the oxygen supply isn't enough. And so then that causes pain. And if it's really bad and comes even when you're resting, that's called unstable angina. And then if it gets so bad and there's very little blood flow, and usually you put some extra load on your heart, then the oxygen deficit is so big that you get an ischemic injury or actual cell death or cell necrosis, meaning that myocardial tissue, the heart cells tissue, dies. So that's very clear. We all learned that. It's sort of like mother's milk and apple pie and American exceptionalism. And of course, probably people won't be surprised, but I had occasion to start questioning that. So I finished my internship and I start my private sort of holistic practice. And I also need to make money. So I ended up getting a job and getting trained as an ER doctor. And so I end up seeing, you know, scores, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people with chest pain, some of whom were having heart attacks, some of whom thought they were having heart attacks. But my job was to evaluate them and see which of them were having heart attacks and then refer them to the cardiologist. And so I became used to dealing with heart patients and I started asking myself some questions. So here's sort of how that went. I said to myself, okay, if all the blood goes through these three major vessels, all the blood to the heart, is the blood everywhere in the body the same? In other words, there must be something in the blood which is precipitating or settling or doing something to the arteries so that this blockage happens. So again, is the blood that goes through the coronary arteries the same as the blood that goes through, say, the splenic artery? That's the artery to the spleen, hepatic artery to the liver, femoral artery to your leg, foot artery, brain artery, 
kidneys, all the rest of the arteries? And obviously the answer is yes. Nobody, as far as I know, thinks that you have a special blood that only goes through your coronary arteries that's different than the blood going through the spleen artery. Okay, next. Are these coronary arteries made of the same material and essentially anatomically and histologically identical to the artery, to the spleen and liver and foot and brain and pancreas and all the rest? And again, as far as I know, there is no theory that says that the coronary arteries, the heart arteries, are somehow different than all the rest of the arteries in the body. In other words, arteries are arteries, the blood is the blood, and so there's no difference in the blood and arteries in the heart versus the artery and blood to the spleen. If that's the case, and there's something in the blood that's causing this precipitation of plaque, it obviously must happen to every artery in the body. And that turns out to be true. So you get plaque in your renal artery and hepatic artery and splenic artery. As time went on, medicine and science tried to investigate which part of the blood was causing this plaque. Originally, they said cholesterol. And then they said, no, it's a certain type of lipoprotein called LDL. And then they said, no, it's not just all the LDL, it's LP little a, or it's not just LP little a, it's the relation of LDL to HDL or LP little a to HDL. So they get more and more specific about which component it is in the blood. The next step in this was people said, well, okay, it may not be something in the blood, it's an inflammatory process, and it's this chronic inflammation, maybe an infection or maybe something else. And so it's not just the cholesterol or the LDL or the low HDL, it's a chronic inflammatory process, but in all the arteries of the body, coronary artery, spleen artery, liver artery. So then I said, well, if that's true, and this is an artery problem, I'm going to find out if anybody has a spleen attack or a liver attack or a foot attack or a kidney attack. So over the years, it's starting in the ER and then my private patients. And then every lecture I gave on the heart for the last 20 some years, I asked everybody in the audience, anybody know of anybody with a heart attack? personally, or family member, or friend, or Dick Cheney, or Bill Clinton, or any of these people, and 100% of the people raised their hand, because everybody knows somebody who had a heart attack, and a lot of people have it themselves, and then I would say, how many people know somebody, or had personal experience, or know of a celebrity, or somebody they heard of who had a spleen attack, and maybe we're talking 50 to 100,000 people I've asked, and I'm sure you can guess the number of people who raised their hand and said yes was exactly zero. Nobody has ever seen or heard of or knows anybody who had a liver attack or a spleen attack or any other kind of attack besides a heart attack or a brain attack, otherwise known as a stroke. So what's the problem? Why don't these other organs have attacks? They obviously have blockages too. So what's the difference? So that was my first question in this theory. And the second one was something that I kept seeing over the years in my private practice. And then I ended up seeing, uh, I don't know, maybe hundreds of people who had almost the same story. So here is a typical story. 55-year-old male, usually men, they come in with their wife or some significant other, and I say, what happened? And they say, well, I was mostly fine, and then I was walking up, you know, Mount Tam or some went on some hike or shoveled snow or did something, and I started to have a little pain in my chest, 
And I didn't think much of it and I stopped and it went away and then I started again and it came back. And I made the mistake of telling my wife and she insisted that I go to the cardiologist. And so I did. And I told him the story and he did a, an EKG, then a stress echo, and then he did an angiogram. And then he said, oh, we found that in your right coronary artery or left anterior descending artery, you have a 95% blockage. And, and usually they would wag their finger at them like this. If you block any more than that, you could die of a heart attack. So I started thinking about this. And if you accept the premise that all of the blood flow to your heart goes through these three coronary arteries, then obviously that means if you have a 95% blockage, that you have 5% blood flow to your heart. And the first thing that I thought about that was anybody who has 5% blood flow to a major organ, they couldn't possibly walk up any hill or even practically get out of bed. And second of all, so you mean to tell me that if you block from 5% blood flow down to what, 2% or 3% or even 1%, that that's what's going to kill you, that last three or two percent. And I simply couldn't believe it. So that made me start looking into, have there ever been studies that actually looked at people who had heart attacks or maybe even died of heart attacks? How many of them actually had a significant clot or plaque buildup in the artery leading to that part of their heart? What I found then surprised me because there was actually a lot of studies going back to the 40s when, believe it or not, it turns out that most of the cardiologists at that time didn't believe in this thrombogenic theory of heart disease. They said actually that people who had plaque buildup had less heart attacks than people who didn't. And that surprised me. And then they started doing studies and for anybody who's really interested in this, the best research study ever done, which was really a life's work, was a Italian pathologist named Giorgio Baroldi. And he wrote a book, and I'm not sure the name of it, The Edo Pathogenesis of Coronary Artery or Heart Disease or something. And what he came to the conclusion is that exactly 41% of people who died of heart attacks. So now these are obviously the worst of the worst because they died. So 41% had a significant blockage of the coronary artery leading to that part of the heart. And then what he also found is that of those 41%, half of the blockages came after the heart attack which you can tell by autopsy, not before the heart attack. So if you do the math, what you find is that something like 80% of the people who die of heart attacks, which is again, the worst of the worst, actually have no significant blockage of the coronary artery leading to that part of the heart before they have a heart attack. Now, that doesn't even mean that the 20%, the reason they had a heart attack or died of a heart attack was because of the blockage. But what it does mean is that at a maximum, only 20% of the people who die of a heart attack have a significant blockage. So the question is, what happened to those other 80%? So the next step in my investigation of this was actually researching the history of coronary artery bypass grafting and stent placement. Now, obviously the theory of both of those is you have a blockage, it's a mechanical you know, restriction of the blood flow due to plaque. And so we're either going to bypass that by putting in a vein from your leg or an artery from your chest or we're gonna some sort of roto rooter thing and then put a stent in to keep it open and that should solve the problem. But over and over again, and there are a number of studies in the New England Journal, there have been a bunch of studies and you can find these easily in my book where 
what they found was consistently that doing bypasses or stents had no effect on how long the person lived and it had no effect on whether they had a second heart or a follow-up heart attack. The only thing that they could actually demonstrate that was a, a benefit from doing either a bypass or a stent was that there was a reduction in angina or otherwise known as chest pain from the heart. So that's interesting because you would think it would work if that was the problem. Clearly it doesn't work because if you don't live longer and you don't prevent a second heart attack, it's hard to say how that worked. Uh, so all only thing we were left with and the only thing that a heart cardiac surgeon was really allowed to tell a patient was that this will help reduce your pain. However, it turns out there was actually a study that tried to see if even this was correct. And here's the study. This was published here, lancet.com, November 2nd, 2017. And as far as I know, this was the first time in history that they actually did a blinded study of stents. In other words, as you could see, they enrolled 230 patients who had chest pain and half of them, they put a stent in and the other half, they did a catheterization and then they pulled it out. They told them they did a stent, but they didn't. And then they followed them for the next eight weeks. And it turns out that these two groups had exactly the same amount of chest pain in eight weeks the ones who had the stent and the ones who were simply told they had the stent. So it doesn't reduce your chest pain over placebo, which did reduce their chest pain. The people who had the dummy stent actually did have less chest pain for whatever reason. Doesn't prevent further heart attacks, doesn't help you live longer. I remember at the time, the New York Times and the Atlantic, I believe, did stories on this with the headlines saying, stents proven useless, which is a big deal considering, well, I don't know the exact amount of money that stents cost the United States or hospitals or people, but I've heard numbers like $50 billion a year. So this is a huge business for a procedure, which as far as the science says, does nothing. They actually interviewed a cardiologist from UCSF about the results of this. And she said, What's interesting about this is this will convince cardiologists and patients that heart disease is not simply a result of blocked arteries, but is a multifactorial disease and it's a systemic disease and the plaque buildup is only one manifestation. And I must admit when I read that, I almost fell off my chair because that was essentially what the second part of my book was, which was what are these systemic factors that are causing at least 80% of the people to have a heart attack. And then the final thing is I ran across this video, this is more recently, which I think shows everything you need to know about the fallacy of this thrombogenic theory so that nobody believes in this theory ever again. So this is a typical picture that cardiologists love to show their heart patients, and they usually will tell you this part here was blocked, and this part here, these are the three main coronary arteries, and this is their depiction of the blood supply to your heart. As you can see, all of the blood goes through these three major arteries. The first thing I want to point out is this is not actually a real heart or a real photograph of the blood supply. Obviously, this is a drawing. Somebody was told to draw this, and as you'll see, it actually has no relation to the actual blood supply of the heart. In this short film, made during an angio, the right coronary artery at left hand will be filled with contrast medium using a heart catheter. So every time in all my years of practice since this came out, when a person with heart disease came to my 
office, I would show them this and say, this is my patient intelligence test. I would also point out that it took me 20 years to figure this out. So I'll give you 15 seconds. And the question was, so the dye is put in up here through the catheter. Here's the right coronary artery. Here's the blockage. So all you know is this picture. How do you already know that this whole theory is basically a crock? So let's run through the video. I want to show you the most important result of this examination in advance. You can see a severe narrowing, a stenosis, in the midsection of the artery. Now let us take a look at the angio. I will now show you a series of photos taken from the angio so that you can study the procedure in detail. Here is the first photo. At the upper edge of the picture you see the heart catheter with its curved end still empty of contrast medium. Now the contrast medium starts to appear. You can see the roughly S-shaped form of the upper section of the artery marked by contrast medium. This is the most intriguing photo. Why is this? The most important feature is the dark strip marked at the bottom left of the photo. This shows contrast medium in a section far beyond the stenosis. Nothing can yet be seen of the narrowing itself. Despite this, a section of the coronary artery far beyond the stenosis is already filling up. Here for the first time the stenosis, circled, appears. This is the same photo. The narrowing can be vaguely recognized due to the descending flow from above, but mainly as a result of the ascending flow from below. Things now become clearer. This stenosis hardly allows a single drop of blood to pass. It's not the case, as a layperson might assume, that the blood somehow manages to squeeze through the bottleneck and struggles to fill the lower part of the artery. Yet, it is exactly this section beyond the narrowing that is well filled. The blood must come from somewhere. This is proof that there is a wide network of blood flow called collateral vessels, small vessels, that is the vast majority, I don't know exactly the percentage, probably well over 90 to 95% of the blood flow comes through these other channels, these small vessels. And if you actually see a picture that is showing the actual blood in the heart, you see it looks like a watershed, not three rivers. And so the angiograms, these heart catheter procedure doesn't show these small vessels, probably because of the dye or the pressure that they injected or some other reason. And they pass that off that these vessels don't exist. Even if the collaterals, the vessels that make a detour around the stenosis, are not clearly seen, these photos are proof of their existence and effectivity. This is a perfect illustration of a 90% stenosis. However, this method fails to provide decisive information. It's not possible to show the extensive network of collaterals using the heart catheter. This leads to considerable false interpretations regarding the importance of coronary artery stenosis. In the very small narrowing, a little blood forces its way from above and a little from below. The blood in the stenosis is stagnant. If the narrow passageway is closed completely by a blood clot, a thrombosis, what happens then? Does a heart attack occur, as generally assumed? By no means. The blood is already standing still in the stenosis. 
A complete closure would have no effect. There is no alteration whatsoever. There can be no better illustration. The blood supply to the heart muscle beyond the stenosis is completely unaffected. The right coronary artery is clearly and powerfully displayed far into the regions of its finest branches. The stenosis does not damage the heart. And so this problem cannot be a problem of coronary artery stenosis either by cholesterol, gremlins, LP little a, LDL, decreased HDL, or inflammation of the vessels. The body is not so stupid to put all its eggs in those three baskets and then having a blood flow based on more of a watershed than a river is a much safer strategy and it's much more likely to be the one that nature uses. And this then makes perfect sense of why people with 95% blockages can often and easily walk up hills because they have a perfectly normal blood flow that is actually coming through where most of the flow comes from anyways, which is the collateral circulation. The problem, therefore, must be of the heart itself. And there must be some difference between the heart and the spleen and the leg and the liver and the kidneys and the pancreas. It's the heart versus these other organs, the heart and the brain has nothing to do with the blood vessels or the so-called plaque forming components in the blood. So the question then we're left with is, is there some other way of looking at this that we can explain why people do have heart attacks? And the best information we have about this and what I wrote about in the book and many other places is that there's basically three reasons. The first reason is we have an autonomic nervous system, which is divided into a sympathetic and parasympathetic chain. The sympathetic is the fight or flight. There's a lion chasing you and you have to run. Parasympathetic is life is good and rest and digest. Cardiologists are very aware that this system has a lot to do with the heart. It controls the heart rhythm and the rate and the caliber of the blood vessels to a certain extent. And they routinely ascribe heart disease to an overactive sympathetic activity, which is why they give you beta blockers, because the beta that they're blocking is part of the sympathetic nervous system. So in other words, the theory is too much sympathetic activity, i.e. too much stress, and you have a stressful life, etc. And so we're going to block it, and then you're going to have less pain and live longer. The reality is, and we know this from heart rate variability, that even though excess sympathetic activity and decreased parasympathetic tone are similar, they are not the same. And heart rate variability studies show that over something like 90% of people who have heart attacks have decreased parasympathetic tone in the days, weeks, and months leading up to the event. So in other words, all the things that degrade our parasympathetic nervous system, which means being out of shape and poor exercise and poor food and emotional stress and toxicity and fear, hatred, and lies in your personal life, all these things impact negatively your parasympathetic activity, resulting in decreased parasympathetic tone. And that's what eventually leads to a dysfunction in the metabolism of your heart muscle. And that leads to chest pain and heart attacks. And blocking the sympathetic, while it may help some, is not the same as supporting the parasympathetic, which gets into the whole difference of philosophy. You know, conventional medicine is all about blocking things and real medicine is all about supporting the body to do what it should do. So multi-systemic factor number one is decreased parasympathetic tone. 
of the autonomic nervous system. Systemic disease number two is a failure of the collateral or small vessel blood flow. You will see a picture, an actual examination in what a normal heart circulation looks like. A normal cardiac circulation does have these three major coronary arteries, but it has thousands of small collateral vessels. So a blockage in one just increases the strength and the flow through the collateral circulation, which is why the cardiologist of, of before 1940 said people with plaque developed a more robust collateral circulation. And since that's where the blood flow actually comes from, they actually had better blood flow and so we're less prone to have heart attacks. I'm not necessarily saying that plaque buildup is good, but it certainly wasn't the cause of the heart attack. And this clears up another enigma, which I had wondered about for 30 or 40 years, which is why do diabetics get more heart disease, heart attacks than so-called normal people? Because as far as I know, there is no actual proven theory or proven evidence that diabetics get more plaque. But there is abundant evidence that diabetics have small vessel disease. In other words, they have inflammation and a sort of corrosive effect on their small vessels, which is why they have eye disease and kidney disease and peripheral neuropathy. It's all about the main blood flow to our body, our tissues, which is through the small collateral capillary system. And since that's over 90% of the blood flow to the heart, if you have deterioration of your capillary blood flow, you will have decreased blood flow to your heart and be more susceptible to have a metabolic, a defect in your heart muscle. So that's reason number two. And then the third reason, is in every case of angina or unstable angina, which is basically worse angina, or heart attacks, there's a buildup of lactic acid in the heart tissue, the heart muscle. So even though the heart is not a pump, it is a muscle and it does expand and contract. And it is supposed to move when the blood enters to expand. And then when the blood exits, then the heart muscle constricts. It's not pushing or pumping anything. And number three is by far the most important because all heart attacks have to go through this process. And it goes something like this. Because of decreased parasympathetic tone, because of small vessel disease, because of mitochondrial injury or disease or dysfunction, and this can happen because of EMF exposure, heavy metal exposure, antibiotics, because the mitochondria are supposedly old bacteria, chronic stress, lots of things interfere with mitochondrial function, which is the part of your tissues that generate the ATP, which as I've said, helps structure the water and creates the energy. And the ATP is made through a process called oxidative phosphorylation. And so if all is well, you have a healthy parasympathetic tone, you have good collateral blood flow, you haven't taken antibiotics and EMF exposure, and you've done earthing and good diet and all the rest, you will have healthy mitochondria and you will use oxidative phosphorylation respiration to generate ATP, which will structure your water, to create the voltage, which is what we call life. Now, you could have a situation where because of the things I just mentioned, your mitochondria are diseased and don't function properly. And then in any kind of stressful situation, you will resort to the backup mechanism of generating ATP, which is called fermentation or glycolysis. And this is much less efficient on the order of two ATPs per sugar as opposed to around 36 in respiration. And the byproduct of fermentation is lactic acid. 
And it's the buildup of the lactic acid, which then acidifies your tissue. And the same thing happens in your leg and your spleen. So if it happens in your leg, you have buildup of lactic acid in your leg tissue, and that causes pain and cramps in your leg and you stop your leg from moving because of the pain. If it happens in your spleen, your spleen stops. If it happens in your liver, the metabolism of your liver stops. The only two organs that can't stop are your heart and your brain. And so what happens then, obviously, is this glycolysis continues, the lactic acid continues to build up, the tissue becomes acidic, not because you eat acidic food or acid food or because of your diet, except insofar as it helps foster healthy mitochondria. This is entirely an energetic problem of a switch from normal respiration to fermentation. Interestingly, the same process that happens in cancer, the acidosis, the lactic acid continues to build up in the tissues which then acidifies the tissue. Uh, the result is that prevents the calcium from getting into the heart muscle. And so the area that the calcium can't get in that's acidified becomes so-called dyskinetic or akinetic, meaning it doesn't move properly because the calcium is the stimulation for the contraction of the muscle. And that's exactly what you see on a stress echo or a thallium stress test. So in other words, the heart is a muscle and it's supposed to contract. It actually contracts like a sponge to create a spiral, but let's not worry about that right now. And what you see on a stress echo is this part here is not moving properly. And so the cardiologists say there's a blockage in the artery leading to that part of the heart, but they're not seeing any blockage all they're seeing is an area of the heart that's not moving properly. And that comes now we know because the calcium can't get into the tissues in that area, which paralyzes it. So now we have an area of the heart that's essentially being poisoned by the acids that are building up because you don't have enough respiration because there's been some damage to the mitochondria. And you can demonstrate with animal studies, for instance, this was done by Manfred von Arden back in the 40s and 50s, that in every case of angina, there's a buildup of lactic acid causing the cramps and the pain, much more than a decrease in oxygen. So this is a metabolic problem. It's a problem of the utilization of the oxygen, and it's essentially a mitochondrial defect causing this glycolytic shift, causing first pain called angina, then the calcium can't get into the cell, into the tissues, then the acidity builds up because the heart is still moving and it still can't respire, and that causes necrosis, that causes breaking off of little pieces, and that's exactly the sequence of events you see. And that's what we call a heart attack. It's as simple and straightforward as that. Now, once an area of the heart is dead because of this necrosis, because of the acidification, the blood supply has a harder time getting through that area because it's dead. And so you get buildup of debris upstream from the blockage, just like if you put a beaver dam in the river, you would get debris upstream from the beaver dam. This exactly explains why you see blockages after the heart attack and often not before, just like Baroldi said, the blockages are a result of the buildup of debris because of the now defect in the muscle metabolism. That's also why if you go in there in the immediate sense and flush out the debris, you will get a partial restoration of the blood flow and a return temporarily to a more normal metabolism of the heart. But you haven't actually fixed anything because the blockage was not the problem. It was the consequence, not the cause of the heart attack in the first place.
And then you have a situation that comes up in medicine frequently like high blood pressure. So why do we have high blood pressure? Well, according to medicine, 99% of high blood pressure is called essential hypertension, otherwise known as idiopathic. That means we don't know why the person has high blood pressure. But if you think of it, so you have heart, let's just say it's stagnant in the blood, and then the heart squeezes and that pushes the blood through this set of tubes called arteries. If the pressure is too high, for instance, because it's pumping too much, then you would think the best way to deal with this is to slow down the pump. And in fact, that's what they do. They essentially slow down the pump with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, or they decrease the volume of blood with things like diuretics. And that whole way of treating it comes out of this pressure propulsion model. If you think of it in a different way, which is the blood is an autonomous organ and the primary reason for the movement of the blood comes through the dynamics that happen in the blood itself, then the problem with blood pressure suddenly looks different. So in order to compensate for low flow, you have to narrow the tube to keep generating pressure. If what I'm saying is true, that the flow of the blood comes from the blood itself, then if the flow is weak, the body has no choice but to narrow the tubes to keep the flow moving. And that narrowing of the tubes is what we call high blood pressure. And if that's true, it doesn't mean having high blood pressure is good for you, but it does mean that narrowing the tubes is a compensation mechanism for dealing with low flow. Or I often put it another way, what would you do if you were the body and suddenly your flow was diminished and you need to keep the blood flowing so you can bring blood flow to all the different organs, you would have no choice but to narrow the tubes. That's what the body does. That means the higher blood pressure is the therapy for low flow. Now, one could say, well, how do I know that I'm right here? It's very simple because you can ask any doctor, how many people have you cured of high blood pressure by stopping the pumping action of their heart? And the answer is zero. That's why they tell you you have to take high blood pressure medicines the rest of your life. Because they have to keep widening the tubes or slowing down the pump in order to lower your blood pressure. On the other hand, if you do things to increase the flow, the body will say, we don't need to narrow the tubes anymore. We can let the tubes relax because the reason we were squeezing down was to keep the flow. And then you're literally done with high blood pressure. So it has huge repercussions because one way is a lifetime of essentially toxic drugs that you have to keep taking because the situation gets worse and worse. And the other way, by seeing the true dynamics of how blood flows and how pressure is created, you end up being able to actually heal the person. That's not by having anything to do with the heart. That's by getting them out in the sunshine, for instance, getting their feet connected with the earth. By the way, I didn't write this in my book either, but... There is a Spanish group of cardiologists who are also saying the heart is not a pump, it's a vortex device. And they talk about the ventricular muscle bands. And they said something very interesting, which is the heart creates this vortex because of the characteristic shape. But as the heart gets weaker, it goes from a vortexing device to a more globular device shaped as a sphere. And so it's a much less efficient way of helping the circulation of the blood.
And it turns out that when it becomes globular, it actually, in a sense, does start to pump. But that's a death spiral. Once the heart starts to pump, it's such an inefficient way of moving the blood that the body starts using more and more, almost all of its energy, just to keep this heart pumping the blood. Now, what you see with people with end-stage heart failure is their fluids stop circulating. So the fluids essentially succumb to gravity, so they collect in their feet, and they shrivel up and basically lose all their energy, all their muscle mass. Every part of their energetic utilization goes towards pumping the blood. And then after a few months, they die. So it's an interesting metaphor because if you do start pumping with your heart, you've got like two or three months to live because that's such an inefficient way for the heart to participate in the circulation. And by some strange quirk, we think that that's the normal way to do it. It's the death spiral way to do it. We now know why the blood moves. And so what does the heart do? So uh, a friend of mine wrote a very interesting article called The Heart Pump or Impedance Device. An impedance device means that it impedes the flow of the blood. Now, Rudolf Steiner compared the heart function to a hydraulic ram, which is a very apt analogy because if you think of it, a hydraulic ram is a device that you put in fast moving water. You have a gate, you have a flexible holding tank. So the water comes in, it expands the holding tank because the heart is a muscle which can expand. And that creates positive pressure on the incoming side and a vacuum on the other side of the gate. When the pressure differential is big enough, the gate opens, there's a suction effect because of this vacuum created on the far side of the gate that sucks the aortic arch in and the blood is ejected without any contraction of the muscular walls. The blood is ejected through the buildup of the momentum, I think you would call it, and the muscular walls just passively contract around that. And one of the proofs that this is the case is there's something called an ejection fraction, which is the percentage of blood that comes out of the left ventricle at each cycle. And in normal pressure propulsion pumps, it should be around 100%, but the highest it is in a heart is around 70% in trained athletes, which is exactly the percentage that the water comes out in a hydraulic ram. So there's a lot more to it than that, but that was my conclusion that the main driver of the circulation is this anomalous fourth phase property of water, which creates the separation of charges. In other words, electricity voltage that then drives the movement of the blood up. It's an electrical conduction system. So there's no need for the heart to squeeze anything. The function of the heart is to expand, let the blood come in, let the pressure differential build up on the forward side versus the far side of the gate. That will naturally cause the gate to open, a suction phenomena happens, and the blood gets distributed to the various parts of the body. Now, it's even more interesting and more complicated than that. And for this part, Leonardo da Vinci actually got it right because in his glass models of the heart, he could see that what happens inside the heart, so the blood comes into the heart, it's held in this holding tank, and then the heart squeezes it with a twisting motion, which creates a vortex, in other words, like a tornado or a spiral, which, as everybody knows, the creative energy of the universe, everything from 
the Milky Way to our DNA, to snails, sunflowers, everything. The energy of creation is in the form of a vortex. So not only does it hold it back, but it configures the outgoing blood in the form of a vortex, which gives a sort of creative energy to the blood so that it can move to the various places of the body. Anybody who's interested in what actually happens in the heart should really check this guy out. His name is Francisco Torrent Guasp. And he was a Spanish cardiologist who actually analyzed the structure of the heart. So this is done with a bovine heart, but it's exactly the same with a human heart. So what he did was he boils the heart for half an hour just to soften it up. And then using only his hands, he dissects the heart. And what he finds is that the heart is a continuous band that's simply rolled up. <laughs> this is a dramatically different finding than what we're told, that it's basically formed all as a unit and but if you look at the last picture, lower right-hand corner, and you start where the guy's hand is on the left, and you go to that, you see at a certain point it crosses, and then it goes to the rest. Now, if we go to the next slide, there's another view of it. The part on the left with the R is the right ventricle. The part on the left is the left. And this is what a unrolled heart actually looks like. And what he found is that the heart functions like this. So first of all, the apex, which is the bottom of the heart, is always completely still, it's fixed, and it's only one layer thick. The base of the heart, which is the ring at the top, is the part that moves. And what happens is there's an ascending and a descending segment of muscle. When the heart contracts, the descending fibers contract in a spiral fashion. The base of the heart is lowered, and that essentially wrings the blood out of the ventricles, which is exactly how the blood is ejected from the heart, like wringing a wet towel out. Then once it's rung, the ascending branch contracts, and this lengthens the heart, the base of the heart, the top of the heart moves up. This creates a suction effect, and that sucks the blood from the circulation, from the tissues, up through the venous circulation, back up to the heart. We now know that because of the iron content probably in the blood and the fact that it creates this vortex vortexing down ejection vortexing up suction it creates a magnetic field around the heart and it's actually shaped like a torus which is like a donut we've been actually able to map this electromagnetic field so we know exactly the strength and we know how far out it reaches we know that every organ has its own electromagnetic field. It has its own strength, its own shape. And the heart is by far the strongest electromagnetic field. And all the other organs, therefore, entrain on or get their messages, their direction from the heart. Oh, and there's a tomograph picture, I guess, of the vortex movement of the blood. Final slide. There you can see a flow diagram of this creation of this torus field and how the blood moves in these spiral formations through the arteries. It's not anything like the laminar flow that we learned about in medical school. Now, there's even some newer information that inside the heart, there's all these fibers called trabeculi. So what are they doing there and what's the purpose? It turns out that the heart creates this big vortex, but it also creates mini vortices at these areas of these fibers, the trabeculi, all along the inside of the heart. And there's some very interesting evidence that 
different areas inside the heart are somehow, by some way which we don't understand, connected with different parts of the body. So, for instance, there may be one part of the heart which is connected with the spleen. In that part of the heart, inside the big vortex, a small vortex is formed that has old red blood cells that are meant to be taken out of the circulation by the spleen. So essentially they're packaged in this spleen destined vortex and sent to the spleen to be removed. If you have a cut on your leg and you need a band-aid, you need sutures to repair your cut, the area of your heart that's connected with that part of your leg dissolves some of its fibers, puts them in a vortex, and sends them to the area that you have a cut so that the body can use those fibers to essentially sew up or knit together the cut. The freshly made, more energized, more oxygen-rich red blood cells are sent to the brain. This guy who has all this research on this, he's tagged them, seen the vortexes. Johns Hopkins has done a series of MRIs and CT scans to see this vortex happening. So it isn't just da Vinci 400 years ago. It's modern evidence shows the vortexes within the vortexes. And that's the function of the heart, to essentially assess the condition of the body. The heart is the listening device to the rest of the body and has a packaging system. And it knows what these different organs need. It acts as the conductor of the symphony. And if you think the heart is a pump, you miss all this because you think it's a mechanical device and somehow you don't understand what the heart is really doing, which is far more interesting, intricate, and valuable for our health. There is a medicine called strophanthus. Strophanthus is the seed of the strophanthus gratis plant. It grows like a perennial vine in Madagascar and other parts of Africa and the Cameroon. And this perennial vine, 200, 300 feet, makes pods and it's loaded with seeds. And the seeds have a chemical which is called in Europe G. strophanthine and in the United States, Wabain, O U A B A I N. It's kind of a fun word to say. So, Wabain is the so called active ingredient, it's considered a cardiac glycoside, which is the family of chemicals like digoxin that have an effect on the heart. So actually the native people in the Cameroon, they actually call strophanthus seeds the gift from paradise because they have so many uses and it's their sort of special medicine, their homunculus. So they climb up the vines, they throw down the pods, the pods are open, the seeds are collected and dried. And then they're sent to Germany and Brazil to be processed into medicine. So what does strophanthus seed wabain do? So it has three basic effects. The first is it supports the parasympathetic nervous system. In other words, it's considered a parasympathetic nervous system tonic. The active ingredient from the strophanthus seeds leads to a release of acetylcholine in the myocardium. This is the central chemical mediator of the parasympathetic nervous system in the heart. So that's activity number one, which goes directly back into the cause, because one of the main causes of these heart disease in the first place is decreased parasympathetic activity, which is basically what we call stress or People who don't connect with nature or people who don't eat good food, who don't exercise and decrease parasympathetic activity comes from cigarette smoking, inactivity, psychological, emotional stress, all the things that we know that cause disease. The second thing that strophanthus seed extract slash wabain does is it shrinks and makes the red blood cells and platelets more flexible. So if you can imagine the thing that determines 
the flow through the capillaries. We have these capillaries and we have red blood cells, which are approximately the size of the internal diameter of the capillary. So in order for them to make a smooth passage through the capillaries, they have to be soft and flexible. And strophanthus helps with that. It makes them a little smaller and a little more flexible. And so the microcirculation is improved. So that directly affects a systemic disease number two, which is a decreased blood flow through the microcirculation. And the third and the most important, which has been demonstrated in a number of studies, there's a bunch of research papers. If you go to PubMed, you can find hundreds of articles on wabain and heart disease, wabain and cancer, et cetera. But we now know that wabain converts lactic acid, which is the central poison in this drama, into a nutrient called pyruvate which then is a nutrient used in respiration. So the very poison that makes the muscle paralyzed and causes pain and causes necrosis of the tissue is actually broken down or converted into an important nutrient which goes back into the respiratory cycle, into the oxidative phosphorylation cycle, thereby restoring the normal energy pathways, thereby stopping the buildup of acidity through the buildup of lactic acid, therefore decreasing or stopping the angina and decreasing or stopping the progression to heart attacks and increasing the metabolic activity, the energetics of the heart and that is the key to the treatment of heart failure and heart attacks and angina overall. And here we have a book by a guy that I know called Hauk Furstenworth called Wabain, A Gift from Paradise. Wabain enhances the metabolic effect of acetylcholine and inhibits an increased oxygen consumption induced by adrenaline. This is key. When you treat somebody with wabain, you are essentially pre-treating their heart so that if they're exposed to adrenaline, which is the chemical basis of the sympathetic nervous system, it inhibits an increased oxygen consumption, thereby protecting the heart. Wabain promotes fatty acid metabolism, stimulates glycogen synthesis, and increases protein synthesis in the heart. In other words, all these things, mobilization of fats and glycogen synthesis is a way to increase the metabolism of the heart cells, even under a stressful condition. Herman Rhine has shown in dogs on ligation of the coronary arteries, the animals have become, quote, resistant to oxygen deficiency for hours after wabain administration. In other words, if you give wabain to dogs and then deprive them by ligating or closing down their entire coronary artery, they still survive for hours because their heart cells keep their metabolic activity even in the absence of oxygen. I want to say two other uses that have come to my attention in the last number of years. One is that strophanthus, the original person who told me how to use it in the research, always used to say to me, Tom, you should give this to every patient over 55. And of course, I didn't do that because I didn't know the rationale for this. But about a year and a half ago, there was a paper on looking at what are called senolytic agents. And the theory of the paper is that as we age, that we build up these so-called senescent cells and any chronic disease, whether it's heart disease, cancer, Parkinson's, ALS, you always see the accumulation of these senescent cells in the tissues. The idea is that these senescent cells are old, damaged, or precancerous cells that build up in the body as we age and they 
have a huge effect on accounting for the age-related diseases that we experience. So agents that selectively get rid of these senescent cells are termed senolytics and have proven beneficial in many animal models of many age-related diseases. And in this study, we show that the cardiac glyposide wabaine is a senolytic agent with broad activity. In fact, they go on to say in this article that of all of the supplements and vitamins and pharmaceuticals that they tested, that wabaine was the most effective senolytic agent and also eliminates senescent pre-neoplastic cells. And so while I don't necessarily agree that all the science of the mechanism is correct, what again they're able to show is that strophanthus, i.e. wabaine, protects the tissue and essentially makes the tissue look younger and less senescent and therefore less prone to all the various kind of diseases that happen through this senescence process. You can imagine that this is a factor in aging for basically everybody, and it gives a very good rationale for why, in fact, everybody over 55 might be well-served by taking strophanthus seed extract. And that, of course, is not all. So if you go to PubMed and you put in just wabaine and cancer, you find something like 200 different articles. And again, while I don't necessarily agree with the science, so this is about the sodium potassium pump, which doesn't exist, but it's also about wabaine and related cardiac glycosides are a new paradigm for the development of anti-breast cancer drugs. And the several lines of evidence suggest that both of them possess potent anti-breast cancer activity. And they're not exactly sure how it works, uh, obviously, because they don't understand cell biology properly. But as Ling said, wabaine is a central modulator of the structure of the water inside the cells. And so by decreasing the acidity, by stimulating ATP synthesis, and by its seemingly direct activity on structuring the water in our cytoplasm, it creates the energy which is the basis of all life. And that energy is what actually protects the metabolism and keeps the tissues from going into this so-called glycolytic shift, which is one of the hallmarks. This is the Warburg effect. Whenever tissue runs out of energy, it goes into a fermentation metabolism, builds up lactic acid, and he claimed that that was the root of all this transition to cancer process. And wabaine directly inhibits that through its multiple effects. We have an article just to show that it's not just breast cancer or prostate cancer. They talk about wabaine enhances lung cancer cell detachment, meaning a chemical called wabaine hormone has been shown to play a role in several types of cancer cell behavior. And here they're looking on its effect on cancer metastases, which I would say is the wrong concept for this. But even at low concentrations, the detachment-inducing effect of wabaine was found to be mediated through all this, and therefore the metastases can't take hold, and so people are susceptible to less metastases if they're pre-treated or concurrently treated with strophanthus seed wabaine extracts. So I could go on. There's literally hundreds of articles about wabaine and cancer and its effect on metabolism, the protection against oxygen deficit, the protection and treatment of hyperacidity, and all the rest. Because remember, what we're talking about is the gift from paradise. And what that means is it supports all the metabolic activity of our tissues. 
And this is a medicine which, as was pointed out in Soroka's article, has little to no toxicity when given in the right doses, in the right form. And it's been in basically safe use for a hundred years. It was the main medicine used in Germany for many years. They even had what they call this strophantine challenge test. So if you went to your family doctor and you said you had chest pain, they would give you some strophanthus seed extract. And if the chest pain went away, that essentially proved that the chest pain was coming from your heart, not from something else. There's been very rare instances in reported medical literature, even though they say it's some sort of arrow poison, et cetera, but it's been used safely for a hundred years. Very few reported side effects or negative consequences. It's compatible with any other prescription drug, which I hope most people will avoid. It's compatible with any herb, with the possible exception of digitalis. If they're both considered cardiac glycosides. Wabaine, the active ingredient in strophanthus, is water-soluble, therefore it gets excreted out of the body quickly, as opposed to the active ingredient in digitalis called digoxin, which is fat-soluble, and so it tends to accumulate in the body. And all of this is what led me years ago to say that this is something that I needed to be able to offer to all my patients and all of our listeners. We're basically the only company, the only place that distributes a real strophanthus extract. And so until very recently, I've sort of restricted access to it to only licensed healthcare practitioners. And we got cases after cases of things which I had never seen before with the treatment of people with angina and chest pain and unstable angina and congestive heart failure. And so that led me to increase its use, to use it for essentially all of my heart patients, and then eventually all the cancer patients, and then eventually for all the people who were in the aging process, which is basically all of us over 55 or 60, and then all of us who were exposed to the toxic, sympathetic-inducing effects of our environment, fear and electromagnetic fields, all these things which actually break down our tissues. So as we did this, we found the source. We worked with people in Germany and Brazil who were getting actual strophanthus seed extracts. So that's why we call this a strophanthus seed extract. It's not pure chemical wabaine, which some people sell, and it's not homeopathic strophanthus or wabaine, which has no wabaine in it. Because as far as we can tell from the research and from my 20 years or so of working with it, in order for it to work, you have to A, start with the entire seed because there's apparently some cofactors in there which are necessary for it working. So chemical wabaine is not effective. So that means you end up with a strophanthus seed extract with an approximate known amount of wabaine per drop or per capsule. The dose of it is usually it's taken on an empty stomach and because it's water soluble, it tends to get out of the system fast. So people usually use it three times a day. For capsules, the usual dose is one capsule three times a day. And because it's better absorbed through the oral mucosa, it's good to open the capsule and shake the powder, let it sit in your mouth for a minute to get absorbed. And usually I had people do that one, three times a day. Occasionally I would go up to two, three times a day. With the liquid, usually you start with somewhere between five and 10 drops three times a day. Again, you put the drops directly in the mouth. They're a little bit bitter, so you can dilute it with water if you want. You let them stay in the mouth for about a minute, and then you slowly work up. And what you're looking for is a beneficial effect on sleep or angina or any measurement of heart tests like stress echoes, 
or just an overall sense of well-being, increased stamina. These two preparations are certainly the only preparations in the United States that actually come from strophanthus seed extract that have been verified that they contain the active ingredient wabaine in a therapeutically relevant dose, which is also the proper dose. So there is essentially no possibility of adverse effects. And literally none have been reported with very few exceptions, which usually have extenuating circumstances. So it's very hard to say what happened, but in literally thousands of patients, and I don't know how many thousands of doses, we have essentially zero that I know of bona fide cases of anybody having a untoward reaction or any problem taking strophanthus. On the other hand, we've seen many cases of people's heart failure BNP numbers going down after they were elevated. We've seen their cardiac output go up. We've seen their ability to exercise go up, their ability to withstand stress, their ability to be healthy in times when those around them are getting sick. There has been cases of people's ejection fraction, which is essentially a measure of the effectiveness of the heart, go from something like 18%, which is almost incompatible with life, to back up to 40 to 50%, which is basically normal heart function. So all these cases we have put on our website, a lot of them, they're in my heart book. They're not all cases of people I treat. Many of them were from other practitioners. So it's not just Tom somehow placeboing or hexing people into getting better. It's basically the reaction to this amazing medicine, strophanthus seed extract. It's no surprise that the people called it the gift from paradise. Because if you can do something that protects your tissue, not specific to any particular insult. So whether the insult is cyanide, EMFs, starvation, emotional toxicity, whatever the source of the insult is, what really needs to happen is your tissues need to be supported. And that's what strophanthus wabaine does. That's essentially how it prevents and helps your heart function. That's how it prevents and helps from aging. So that was the impulse for me to make this safe and effective medicine available to anybody who heard this talk. And now you know how to use it, what it's used for, and my commitment is you're the ones who should decide. We don't need layers of so-called experts between us and effective medicine. And I appreciate everybody listening. Mm -hmm.